might be able to, oh, here's the mic came on. We had some trouble with the mics today. I was getting ready to be like George Whitfield who used to project to the, all the colonists uh, for in a whole field, <laughs> like the olden days. Um, all right, back into the 21st century here. Um, can a blind man lead a blind man? Well, we all fall, mostly because we don't see clearly. But Jesus is saying here in this passage, this parable that we just heard chanted, that one of the worst ways to fall is by judging others who fall. Considering this brings to mind some advice that my father got about skiing, and this was from one of his friends. And he said to him, you have to fall in order to ski well. He'd say that a day when you don't fall is a day when you're not really trying. That's the only way, he says, you can learn. But the problem is, is all the critics that are rotting the way up the lift. And if you're one of them, then you're going to be all the more self-conscious when you're skiing and find it all the more difficult to be yourself to do your best. It's like, it's like a vicious circle. And it's a metaphor for life, isn't it? Uh, we tend to expect the benefit of the doubt from others, right? Well, come on, I mean, this is my first time on this slope. Uh, or my skis aren't quite right. But do we extend the same benefit to them. Uh, so it is in, in so many aspects of life. Uh, for example, if you are a little bit short in the way you speak and someone gets indignant, you might say, well, you know, I had a bad day. You don't have to get off your high horse on me. <laughs> but if somebody else speaks that way to you, aren't you going to say, well, gee, what's wrong with you? What did I do to you? See, this is that double standard that is simply present in all of human nature. But Jesus says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? The log is your faults. We get that. But to understand this passage, recognize that your greatest fault is your tendency to judge. The log is that you aren't seeing people with the same generosity that God gives to you. It's backwards. To this Jesus says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now what does it mean to be a hypocrite? Strong words. And I think this on one level applies, well, to all of us. I, I haven't met anybody who hasn't had this trouble. Now, a hypocrite is not simply someone who does not live up to his own standard. After all, no Christian fully does this. That's something to acknowledge. It's actually at the heart of, of truly understanding this passage and being able to move forward with it the right way. No Christian lives up to his own standard. That's not what makes us hypocrites. A hypocrite is somebody who expects something of another that he doesn't expect of himself. And that's where the double standard comes into play. Now, the answer to this is not to lower our standards, those high standards that Jesus gives us in the Beatitudes, those high standards that we don't live up to each day. No, we don't lower those standards. But Instead, it's about our heart towards others who fall just like you and I do. Do we look at them with the generosity that God gives to us? So a tree is known by its fruit. And at the end of our gospel passage today, Jesus says, this is, this is where the heart comes into play. Now, bearing fruit, however, takes putting oneself out there and being willing to fall, just like the skier. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was neither a Catholic nor a saint, but he embraced the muscular Christianity of his day, and love him or hate him, 
no one can deny that he was more willing to put himself out there than he was to criticize others. So we have this, these words from him. It is not the critic he counts who counts. Not the, it is not the critic who counts, he said. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. In other words, each man has a splinter as he strives, no doubt, <laughs> but the critic has the log. And when we, have, when we cultivate that scarcity mentality, when we have this running dialogue of judgment in our minds, then we also project that upon ourselves. And we become more, less likely to act. And we find we live a life of the critic more and more. So Jesus says, an evil person out of this door of evil produces evil. And so when this vicious circle happens, there's less fruit to pass on. For of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. Now, of course, if you try to do what the person you're criticizing is doing, then you tend to have a little bit more compassion for that person, don't you? <laughs> but at some point, someone's going to say, well, I don't fail where he does. I mean, I, I can objectively say that's true. I'm, in, I'm principled at least on that point. Yes, but don't we know that one man's strength is another's weakness? The man you criticize may excel where you fail. And you know this much, at least at this particular moment, he is not here criticizing you. St. Thomas Aquinas says very simply in, in his commentary on the parallel passage in Matthew, he says, call no one a bad man. Why? Because you don't know his heart and you don't know what he's up against. He also says this, expanding on that thought. Aquinas says, the doubtful thing should always be interpreted on the good side. <laughs> always. In other words, give the benefit of the doubt. The answer is always because where is, when is there not a doubt? When do you have all the facts in a circumstance? You know, I used to work with Bishop Madden, and so I would take the calls that would be directed to him. Uh, and some of them would be disputes. And I would hear uh, someone saying, oh, at this church, I was, uh, I've just got this problem who's inhibiting my ministry, and here's what's happening, and I would hear this story, and this person would be very sincere. I think that's horrible. I want to empathize, and I'm with this person. I find myself condemning the person he's speaking to. <laughs> and it's so hard to learn the lesson because this happened over and over again. Then it, when I finally call up the person in question, then I realize, oh, <laughs> there's two sides to this story. <laughs> always. There's always two sides to this story. How is that any different <laughs> with the person you are criticizing now. So to quote a, a statement often attributed to Plato and sometimes to Boethius, I suppose it's an anonymous quote, simply goes as follows. Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. You don't know what that battle is. You don't know what wounds he or she carries. You don't know what is affected why he or she does what she does. 
And so we can objectively acknowledge that an action is wrong, but the problem here is when there's no love in your words. The colic for today reads, anything without charity is nothing worth. <laughs> and so as Christians, we feel at times we've got a place to judge because we have moral standards unlike the world and we need to uphold them. <laughs> but St. Paul in, in this, that, that, that colic is, comes directly from 1 Corinthians 13, where St. Paul says, if you say anything without love, then you're nothing but a clanging gong. In other words, Discipline yourself first. <laughs> Get yourself oriented in love before you dare to judge another. So Jesus here is speaking to, I believe, all of us, um, unless you're the more, a more sanctified person than I have ever met. <laughs> and so someone here might be thinking, well, Lord have mercy, he's speaking of me, and I am one of those critics. Is there any hope for me? Um, but you see, what I'm trying to establish here is that you're not alone. And so where there is a way to go from here. Clearly, Jesus is speaking, however, to some who are more critical than others, some who make this more of a way of life than others. What is, what is the solution? How do we make sure that these words are not applied to us continually? Well. Recently, I heard someone speaking on this passage, and he basically said this, you just better get on your knees and ask the Lord to show you your sins so that you're less likely to condemn somebody else. <laughs> and I hope we all do that on occasion, but what, what is the impetus for that? What is the catalyst to make you do that when this is the way of the world? Well, we have something called the Prayer of St. Ephraim. He's, it was a... a a saint from Syria in the seventh century. And here is his prayer, which can be repeated on a daily basis, especially in Lent. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother. For blessed art thou unto ages of ages. Amen. <laughs> Let me repeat that. Yea, O Lord and King, Grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother. If you're going to grow, then this can be a daily prayer. Actually, the, the Byzantine church recognizes that this double standard that I've been describing is so pervasive that everyone needs to pray this prayer every single day in Lent. It's worked into the daily prayer routine of, of all the Eastern churches, the Eastern Catholic churches, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and so this is something that people in this tradition, a prayer, they know this by heart. Many of them pray it multiple times during the day. And hear how it continues. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me, actually this is how it begins, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk acknowledging I have these things, but give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. And then finally, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother. I put this prayer in the back of the church, by the way, so that you can use it as, as a tool for renewal during Lent. And that's the idea. We, Lent is a time of renewal, not to be condemned ourselves. And so that's how we're able to really use this tool, use this prayer aright. Because the response to a prayer like this is not to say, well, I'm the one who should be condemned and then simply feel condemned yourself. <laughs> There's no power in that. The, the purpose is to receive God's mercy so that we can pass it on to others. For in the beginning of this parable, when Jesus says, the, the blind cannot bleed the blind, he says, no man is greater than his master. And so who is our master but our very Lord, the one who is judged more than any of us? He was crucified, but yet 
he did not condemn even those who judged him. To anybody who repents, he gives mercy. So that's the purpose here, to realize that we all walk by mercy alone. And that's the only way that we can see clearly to have any sort of right words about our brother. That's how we take the beam out of our eyes, or the log in this translation. By following the master and receiving his mercy and seeing others through the lens of that mercy. Eyeglasses, so to speak, of mercy to replace the damage done by the log. So, now this doesn't mean that we can't correct naturally. Uh, it just means this is the work that we must do before we dare to do such a thing. And do we have charity when we correct? Do we try to find out the circumstances first before, before correcting somebody else? After all, Jesus says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes, to realize, yes, no doubt, he needs mercy, even in how I speak to him in this situation. <laughs> For Augustine expands on this. For only, he says, after having removed from your own eye the beam of envy, of malice, of hypocrisy, we shall see clearly to cast out the beam of our brother's eyes. I can say a lot more about this, but I think we're getting the run out of time. But Aquinas goes into a great deal about this passage, as he does about everything. And, and he explains about, well, there are cir circumstances where it is appropriate more for you to correct. If you're in a place of authority over somebody else, then you have a, a duty to correct them. But still, that doesn't change the fact that doubt should be given in every circumstance. <laughs> Always give the benefit of the doubt because there's always doubt as to what battle the person in front of you has been fighting. And so you've heard it said, our, our idiom, a rising tide floats all boats. And that's the idea. So often we, we see people crowding us out and we just want to take out some boats so we have some more room. Or returning to that initial analogy of the skier uh, who falls and we all fall if we really truly want to learn. Well, those falling skiers can get in your way. <laughs> Are you just going to curse them out, or will you encourage them? <laughs> I'm referring metaphorically, of course, to the falling skiers of life that bump into us all the time. <laughs> what if you encourage them? Say, there you go, you're, you're working on it. Here, here's, here's a better way. Or follow me, or, or you know, I just did that earlier. Better yet, <laughs> you can work together and, and a rising tide floats all boats, if we're going to continue the analogy, how about make more snow so we've got more room to ski? Do something productive together. Let's get in the arena together and improve the world because our God has given mercy to us so that we can move forward, so that we can build his kingdom together. And that only happens when we extend mercy to one another.